the third time I joined you here at Aarhus Symposium. Uh, I'm so happy that you keep asking me because I think also from the first year I was here that this is a great gathering. I told the organizers and I will tell you uh, that I moderate a lot of conferences and uh, this, is, uh, this is indeed very professional and the turn of you always, always show and <coughs> the, um, the excitement and delivering questions is uh, overwhelming also compared to like the most uh, uh, top attended at CEO conferences in Denmark, so I just think you should know that. But here today we have uh, the, the, great, the grand leadership panel debate, and uh, now one in one I will call up the, uh, the, the participants and then let's give them a hand. And over here I'd like to see Jeff Gravenhorst from ISS. <laughs> Welcome. With uh, ISS for many, many years, uh, and uh, also in the past years, uh, group CEO, but you've uh, been there for 17 years? Uh, 12. 12, ah, close. okay. <laughs> <laughs> but 12 years, uh, so ISS is in your blood, and ISS, of course, uh, one of the world's largest employers, and here in Denmark, uh, and one of the world's largest cleaning and facility corporations. So, here I would very much like to see Anders Eldrup, former CEO of uh, Dong Energy, and... And of course, uh, today, professional board member in uh, uh, several number of different companies. And, oh, I'm sorry, it's probably something with the, with the microphone, so this is science. Yeah, sorry. And, uh, and uh, before joining uh, Dong Energy as CEO, you were the uh, permanent secretary of state for the Danish Ministry of uh, Finance. So, and I'm looking over at the, can I ask uh, Peter Sting to be here? No? I wasn't told about it. So here we have uh, Bjorn Stein. You'll go here instead. Bjorn Stein, very welcome. CEO of Parallels. <laughs> so you are Norwegian-born, but speaks uh, very, uh, very, uh, uh, very American. But that's because you are now based in Seattle. And uh, Parallels is a 14-year-old, quite successful software company. That's right. Yeah. So and finally, Peter Bartram, please join me on stage. <laughs> And uh, of course, Peter is the, the Danish head of defense since 2012. Before that, he was employed by NATO, based in the US. And uh, you like to call yourself uh, a soldier. So, please give them all one more warm welcome. <laughs> and again, yes, you know the pigeonhole system, so just start typing in there and we'll get back to it in just a short while. To begin with, I'd like to you know, take the round and ask you how you uh, define yourself as, uh, as leader and then, of course, what is good leadership. I trust you all see yourself as, uh, as good leaders. So in that uh, sense, viewer, what defines good leadership? It's a very big question and I, I was actually a little bit anxious when I saw the lineup here to be defining leadership inside of one hour with this kind of firepower on, uh, on the stage. Um, <laughs> For me, leadership is essentially about three things. One of them is to define and explain a direction. The other one is the empathy to understand the team, the people that you lead. Because you if you don't understand them, if you don't understand what's on their mind, what are their hopes, what are their dreams, you'll have no chance of guiding them towards the direction that is your common goal. And the third aspect is to have the integrity to actually carry out the journey together. And the integrity includes um, openness, honesty, and um, treating each person that you work with as an individual um, and not only as um, a, a means to, to carry out the task. So direction, empathy, and integrity. And do you look Those uh, are the three main components of leadership. Do you look for these for uh, three uh, key points in all the leaders that you uh, work with and also, of course, in yourself? Or are there exceptions? Abs absolutely. Uh, and I think uh, I, I have personally had the opportunity to hire and work with leaders who have these in abundance. And I have had the opportunity to not hire and sometimes unhire or fire, as we sometimes call it people who um, <coughs> display consistent failure in any of these three directions or in any of these three components. Do you basically lay people off because they didn't have one of the three key points you say here, like know the direction, empathy or integrity? Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Anas? I think it was very well uh, phrased. Uh, 
but uh, to put it in my words, I have had the privi privilege to work uh, for several years in public sector, as you mentioned, and for a number of years in a private company. And of, of course, leadership is not exactly the same when whether you are in private or public <coughs> uh, sector. But if I should uh, define a common denominator, I would say that uh, what I have learned from these uh, things is that the, the big thing you can do as a, as a CEO or as a, a leader is to set targets, to set the direction, and to communicate this uh, 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 to, the, to the people you are leading. So setting <coughs> targets, uh, clear targets, communicating it by a storytelling, uh, that has been crucial in, in my experience. I have had the privilege to to head organizations, be it private or, or public, which had had to change a lot. And in order to make the crew follow uh, such a change process, communication, storytelling, setting the target, that has been the, the main focus for me. So you put the communications up on the, on, the, on the board as well. Peter Bartram, what defines good leadership for you? I think it's about the achieving the overall objective in an environment uh, which is very much defined by uncertainty and adverse, adverse uh, conditions. I think the leader needs to, as, as, as my, the gentleman next to me has said, needs to set the course and prioritize. That, that's very important. But I also believe you need to be, keep the organization focused. And you need to be able, with your leadership, to, to answer the question, why are we doing it? You need to explain, you need to set up some kind of narrative and explain why we are doing it. it. It needs to make sense to the individual. Why are we moving in this direction? Why are we making a turnaround? This is the leader to, to answer that question. And, you, and that's also very uh, needed in the military, in the armed forces where you are? Oh, very much. If you, need, if you m want people to move forward and they know that there are people out there who might want to kill you, they need a pretty good explanation why they should do it. <laughs> It's true, but still also maybe that's an old-fashioned uh, way of thinking, but in the military you also do what you're told. We you do. You don't need but to be told why. You're not having a, like a ground group discussion. Well, it's you that that to the right or the left, you do what the general tells you. That's a good thing, by the way. Yeah. Now, well, we <laughs> there is a planning phase. There is a planning phase where we are very open and you should allow to be challenged in all ways. But then if you have, when you have made the decision, you want people to, to obey, you want people to, to execute, you order, that's for sure. But you should, before that, before you take the decision, you need to be open and you have to distinguish. So in the Danish uh, military, uh, 20,000 people today. Uh, next to you, there's a guy who has 540,000? 30,000? 529,000. I think every time we meet you, it becomes lower and lower. I know, we're divesting some companies, but oh, that's it. Okay. <laughs> no. All right, but that's over half a million employees. What defines good leadership for you? I think we've said a lot of things up here already and I of course concur to all of it. Maybe I can put it in a different phrase from, from my side. I think we have to remember that our job as leaders is one and one only. That is that we need to get more out of all of the individuals than the individuals could do on their own. So that's number one. That's direction setting, that's actually managing, and that's mm -hmm. the managing part of our job. But it's not enough. Today you need to do one le level more and that's leadership. The managing part is actually quite easy. The leadership part is this common goal, the common purpose, living the common purpose of why we're doing what we're doing. And I know it's a cliche, and I know that a lot of people heard this before, but I keep using it. As leaders, we build cathedrals. We don't cut stones. And it does say everything. That is the, the, the sense that you can't actually learn anywhere, but you can teach yourself as you go along via storytelling, via understanding purpose, and via understanding it's living human beings you're trying to uh, actually get to get more out of than you could do on your own. So unleash the power of the human touch, you have to do that. Before I turn to your questions, I just need to do one more round because as you already addressed yourselves, uh, here we have public, we have private companies, we have people who've been in both. Um, and also, it's a very broad range of branches. Uh, we have like one of the young industries, uh, presented by Parallels, and then probably most the world most old business, or well, something that's prostitution. But I, I think maybe the army was uh, was uh, I don't know which which. Thank you for that parallel. Yeah. Thank you for that parallel. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, well, never mind. So, uh, how has leadership in your fields changed over time? 
not, I'm not going to comment on your age or anything, but you have been around for a while. And can you please explain to me, because just in the past few years, I think the whole management and leadership, uh, just the word management, I know if people think management is like a forbidden word out there, because we don't manage, we lead. But can you please explain me in your different fields how it has changed over the past decades? Um, Jeff, let's begin with you. Yeah, uh, first and foremost, I have to say management is extremely important. I, I think it's actually a, an inward, it's not definitely not an outward. Yeah, it, being leaders with a lot of uh, big thinking and, and words and buzzwords and whatever it is, and being motivational is great when you're a motivational speaker. It's not enough when you're actually leading a company. So you have to be able to know what you're doing here as well. It's not enough to just get a little people clapping and cheering and whatever it is. You have to deliver results. So both is important. <coughs> and I think the old world and the new world are equally important. We just got to mix it in the right way. It's not new to talk about empowerment. Not at all. I mean, Jan Carlson was one of the biggest inspirations for me. Whether or not it succeeded, but it certainly succeeded for a while. But it's been there forever. The cathedral thinking is not from this century. The fact that we're all human beings with a brain and want to actually contribute, that's a fact when you're born. The eager to, to do something for purpose is killed by bad managers. So it's about how do you actually get the old instructions combined with, I actually do this because I know why I'm doing it, and because I know why I'm doing it, I will keep doing it even better. That's the key thing. So it's a combination of things. <coughs> but there's still uh, space for the, uh, the old-fashioned management, as I hear you say. Biwa, how does that uh, work in your company? Do your <coughs> IT engineers like for you to tell them uh, what to do? Well, I think it's, it's, been, uh, it's been a lot of writing and talking about how in the internet era, in the internet business, uh, leading millennials, well, I guess most of the people in this room would fit that bucket is incredibly different from everything that's gone before. And I, I actually don't think that's the case. I think uh, if we, we believe that the world has fundamentally changed, that human motivation, that what's important to a business has fundamentally changed just because we invented some new technology, I think we're fooling ourselves. Um, I had the fortune of being part of the last internet boom, which uh, happened around year 2000, and the same stories were being told then. Oh, these people are so different. They need pool tables and you know, um, Le legal games and uh, yeah, and sofas and what. Uh, otherwise, they're not going to be performing. Turned out to be not true. Then it turned out to that the companies that built on sound leadership principles and managed to value, as opposed to to some fad, were the people who built really good businesses. Google would be an example, um, just to pick one. So I, I, I think the principles of leadership are <coughs> relatively invariant over time. The principles of good business leadership are relatively invariant over time. Uh, what has been happening more and more over the last maybe 20 years is a focus on value creation and a very, very individualized and devolved um, concept of value creation. Where, uh, and I think that's actually where the importance comes in of every individual in the organization understanding purpose and understanding the why question becomes important. Because then you have all your 520,000 people uh, being able to really drive and say, every day I go to work and I deliver more value than I get paid. And that's how value gets created on the company basis. Peter, how does that uh, work for you? In, in your business, it has changed. Yeah, well, when I was a young officer, I saw the senior officers, and they were having a pretty good job. They came in late, and they left uh, early. So I thought, oh, that's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's me in the future. Uh, but it's, it really wasn't. Uh, I think it's becoming much more demanding now. Uh, the expectation is, is, has ri rised a, a lot. We are being challenged by our individual. They step forward, and they challenge us on what we are doing. And the media put us on the front page, so there's no way to escape. Uh, it, it's, it's, you really need to add value. You need to be there, you need to be f committed to your job. It's no easy way. I'm not saying it's not lovely, but it's just much more demanding. And that has changed. Right. And Anas? Yes, being, you know something about being on the front page? I have tried that, <laughs> yes. Um, that's quite interesting. <laughs> I can recommend that for everybody. Uh, <laughs> well, um, I think uh, maybe people have said that for many, uh, many years, but actually I do think that 
uh, things are changing more rapidly now than, than we saw in the past. And I think the stress also <coughs> from the, the media is much higher than, than we were used to. And mm. this, uh, this, of course, challenges uh, the leadership. Uh, to give a, a few uh, examples, what we're seeing in, in, uh, in Europe uh, now all over, but uh, old Europe is being exposed to globalization, meaning that a lot of the things we used to do in the good old days, you are not able to go on doing that. And when I was in the energy sector, a lot of uh, changes took place there. So just to give you two numbers, when I started in 2001, Dong was a gas company. That part of Dong does not exist today, 12, 13 years later. Then we acquired Elsom and, and the, the power stations uh, in the mid uh, 2006, and today uh, they are making no money, so that part of the company almost does not exist any longer. So what was done 10 years at, uh, ago is not there today. What was done uh, five, six years uh, ago is such a little thing today. So the only thing, uh, so what is done today is quite different. Didn't exist at that day, but is now the new dong. And I think you see that in a lot of areas in the public sector. Let me f uh, finalize with that. In the good old days, uh, when we built the welfare state and so on, you could ex uh, exceed the expenditure, you could raise the taxes, and uh, it went on uh, pretty smooth. Today, the you cannot uh, increase the taxes, you cannot in increase expenditures, but we become more and more old people, more and more sick people, so the stress on the system is much higher. So I would say, due to globalization, due to technology, due to, to uh, the stress on the public sector, it has become more difficult to become a leader. And what that means for leadership, we will get back to, I'm quite sure. Now you have had time to vote on each other's questions and also put up some good ones. And uh, we'll grab the one with the most votes now because Jeff already answered it. If I can uh, assume that uh, you meant that uh, Jan Carlson is uh, somebody that you look <coughs> up to as a, as a manager, then the rest of you can answer. So which leaders do you personally admire? Peter. Well, I don't have one in, in particular. I don't have one individual. What, what my, my my you take you can to name this. Two. That's, that's no, fine. no, yeah, but I'm I'm, I'm going to explain myself a little bit. I think you shouldn't aim at one individual and try to make a copycat into yourself. It would not help you. My point to you is, you need to be honest. You need to build your own and create your own leadership profile. And some are very charismatic, outspoken, and they are brilliant in doing so. Others are more uh, academic and their approach more reflecting and they are doing a good job and and you will just fail if you are not outspoken charismatic and trying to be like that so it's it's it the question is wrong because it will not add value so you will need to find in here what what's what's my personal value what is my characteristic and then you need to develop on that but can't you find inspiration in people you think are sure doing it sure so where if have you found inspiration yeah, you're coming back to me, aren't you? Yes, I am, because, because <laughs> I don't we want like names. That. I think no, but I don't names. have that. I don't have that, I don't have that one individual you where I say, I don't, have that, I don't have that name. Okay. I s I, when I meet people, I admire them because they are good communicators, they are brilliant, they are smart, they are clever, they do things. But it, it's not like I have that one single individual who give me that wow effect. So I'm going to rephrase when I ask Anas because I don't want the same answer. So Anas, which people, p managers, leaders, have you met in, uh, in your life that inspired you? I have met uh, people who burn for what they're doing. And uh, that is what has been most important for me to, to, mean, uh, to meet what we call in Danish, I don't know what's the English uh, word, ilsjæl. People who really Passionate have people. a dedication and who, who work through uh, so uh, water and, and, and uh, everything in order to accomplish their, their uh, tasks. Can you remember one you've met that you can share with us? Um, I, I had the same uh, thing uh, as Peter. I, would, uh, I wouldn't uh, take one in front, but, and I think what is a good quality uh, is also dependent on which time, where you are placed. One uh, decade you need this type of people, one another decade you need this type of people. But dedication, that is important all, all the time. And people. So, what do you think? 
Yeah, I, I will forget about rephrasing the question. You already heard it. <laughs> <laughs> Give us a name. Yes, <laughs> there, uh, people I met. Uh, I'll, I'll get back to that. My my first example, and, and it's actually kind of back to uh, my own model for leadership, direction, empathy, and integrity. Um, someone who led perhaps the most important project in history. Uh, not the particularly positive project, but it was called the Manhattan Project. Um, and when the Manhattan Project was in dire straits because it had so many brilliant people in it who couldn't get along and who were basically revolting against their military uh, taskmasters when they appointed Robert Oppenheimer, uh, Dr. Robert Oppenheimer, to lead the project. And he had this incredible, although he had his own demons and actually even mental problems, he had this incredible ability to get the best out of each one of these very unique individuals. And that led to the b construction of the atom atomic bomb, which eventually concluded the Second World War. Um, but um, he's, uh, even though the project itself had a, in a way, both a terrible and very positive outcome, the leadership by Dr. Oppenheimer, I think, is one of these <coughs> stories that um, can be read and studied for, for how you lead in very difficult circumstances. People I met myself, um, it's going to sound uh, kind of strange, but because he's got a very bad rap at the moment, but I think five years down the road, he's going to have a very different reputation. Uh, Steve Ballmer was the head of Microsoft for 14 years as the CEO, for another 20 odd years as, as the almost CEO. Um, and he's actually another individual that uh, I've spent some time with myself that I think really exemplify great leadership. Um, uh, although he doesn't get credit for it at this very moment, I think he will. All right, so uh, I have problems with uh, the tablet um, because I can't get the next question up. Oh, there it goes. And then the next one, which is of course also very interesting because up here there are four men. I don't count uh, because I'm just the moderator. Uh, but uh, there are not so many uh, females among uh, top management. Uh, and, and when you come to, uh, to, to, to the level below, I know there's a lot of female leaders. But on top management, we don't uh, have so many leaders. And um, there we go. Uh, do you have any particular advice for women who would like to become a uh, top manager? Yes? Shall I pull one out or anybody? Yes, Jeff, what about ISS? What, what, what's the track record of, uh, of females in your, uh, in your head management? Extremely bad. But I'll give some advice anyway. <clears throat> and I think the advice is uh, the same as I would give any young man for that matter. It is be authentic to yourself and make sure that you carry yourself along the road. We heard it also from Peter uh, earlier today. I don't think it's such a, I think companies have a different task to be done. You as individuals don't. You can't actually plan it, you can't push it. We as leaders have a job in my mind that we have to do. I don't believe in quotas, but I do believe that we have to make an effort because diversity really matters. And it matters in any way, shape or form, whether it's age or education or race or gender, doesn't matter. But from the individual perspective, do what you're good at and continue to focus on that and that will bring you where you're supposed to go, particularly in this part of the world. Other than that, I don't think there's any advice that you could do, uh, not whether you're a woman or a man, just deliver. What, what do you think about, uh, will this happen automatically when we stand here in 20 years? Um, will two of you be women? Anas? <laughs> that yes. was a weird question. Yes, <laughs> it will happen, uh, in my opinion, because as we see to the universities today and higher education, women are by far the ones who, who uh, outnumber the, the, the boys in the universities. I think it's 60-40 or percent, something like that. So looking ahead, we will see that women are the best educated, have the best uh, skills from the universities, and eventually they will also uh, uh, climb to the, <coughs> to the leadership posts. And it is possible today, I have a wife that is a CEO in... in uh yeah, she's one of you f the few, everybody yeah. knows. So uh, it is it possible, CEO we, of have TV2? we have been working with, with a family with two CEOs, and it's, it's doable, and uh, she... Uh, I tell her the reason why she has been suc so successful is that she has such a caring husband, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you have to find a mix there, but it is doable today and we'll see more and more of that. 
That is quite interesting because that is one of the things you always say when you ask a top CEO, how do you manage? Oh, I have a supportive wife at home and otherwise it couldn't happen and things like that. But you, but you, uh, you manage, but you are not, you, you, there are not so many of you in, in Denmark. No, but we managed to have uh, altogether six children and a dog and uh, yeah. things like that. So it's, <laughs> it's doable. Biwa, what, what about you? You, you, uh, you are in, in, in the software world. Um, of course, there are ma- more females now than when you started in 2000, I assume. But um, you know, th- this has been a big discussion in the on the West Coast, in particular, the last few months, because both Google and Microsoft and Amazon and uh, a couple of the other tech companies, Facebook, they've been uh, asked and they've been disclosing the percentage of females in top management, and it turns out that the percentage of females in software all up has actually gone down. Uh, over the last 20 years, which is, which I think, surprised to to a lot of people. Uh, in top management, it still hovers around 17, 18 percent in in most of these companies, which is not a great statistic. Um, particularly, the tech industry, uh, I believe, has um, has a fair amount of work to do uh, to encourage everybody from uh, young girls during school to engage with technology and not get turned off by uh, you know, all the geeks who know all the terms and hack their own Xboxes and whatnot, but, uh, but really um, engage with technology on their own terms. Um, and then all the way up through how we promote and, and uh, help women uh, succeed. There are a lot of tools you can employ in this. I think uh, I don't think in Denmark, if you have the uh, board level minimum, we don't um, have quo- uh, quota. quotas yet. We no. have that in, in Norway, where you we are do. from. We do. And uh, they have it. Yeah. There was actually a lot of there was a lot of um, skepticism when that first happened, when the government essentially mandated that 40% of board non-executive directors had to be women for listed companies. What do you think of that? I think it's great. Yeah. Can I just have a little uh, uh, tour at the panel? Anas, what do you basically think of that? That there are like rules demanding how many women in board of directors? I'm not uh, in favor of, of, uh, for of such a 40% rule, but uh, I think it's good that we have uh, uh, intentions expressed in our, in our governance structures. And most companies have that, that we want to work to more uh, to walk towards a more equal distribution and I think this soft regulation is working pretty well and it is moving now as I see it but Peter in uh, your um, business well yeah we, we would like to have more female in, in the armed forces but I'm still against having this by force I think it will be in a way contradicting to the overall aim it will take time and you would want that to happen tomorrow but I think you should wait and and women will be there and in some decades, we will defending men's position in boards because so much going on. Uh, two days ago, I talked to Dr. Shaika Al Maskari uh, in uh, in Dubai, and she was the first CEO in United Arab Emirates, and and she is now running several multi-billionaire uh, companies, and she was attending a world congress on females, you know, business. Uh, Potentials. So, so there's so much. It will come. It will take time, and we shouldn't force it by rules. It will be counterproductive. And uh, Jeff, you've already entered it. So we have a, um, uh, a question here that's had many votes as well. I'm going to put it up. Um, I think we already tried to answer it, but uh, since it's up there, uh, maybe uh, we weren't exactly clear on it. So uh, I'm going to put it up just to be absolutely sure that we addressed it uh, full. Um, <coughs> The changes in leadership, like if you had to be very specific and just give me one key word uh, in, in, in your lifetime career, what, what basically changed do you think is the most important key word that changed in being a leader in the past decades? Yes, Peter. Uh, communication. You communication. need to be a good communicator. Jeff. Yeah, storytelling. That was Anas's word, I think. Anas? <laughs> <laughs> so I'll invent a new one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think you have to, to be even more uh, push here on the strategy because the world is changing as I as I mentioned so this uh, setting the direction in a changing world but uh, and then again you can't really make the the, the 10 year stat- strategy anymore so you make strategies all the time right yeah all right uh, people I'll give you one word but I have to be able to explain it later you have okay. to be you have to be Danish <laughs> you have to be Danish okay you can uh, you, you're allowed to explain it now then <laughs> I hope more than me don't understand what you mean yeah, yeah used to be 20 years ago, at least when I started working, that if you were American or French or Japanese, you had the safe career in big multinationals that were based in one country 
and basically run the world with that country's mind frame. That's gone. Most global companies are now truly global. And they're filled with people from all over the world. And what used to be an advantage to come from a majority culture is now a disadvantage because you're less likely to understand people from other cultures because you've, you've been less exposed to them. 17% of Americans have a passport. Pretty much every Dane has a passport. So being from a small culture, being Danish or Dutch or Norwegian or Icelandic, has actually turned from being a disadvantage working for big global companies to being a decide decided advantage. Mm. That's happened the last 20 years, and it's really good news for all of you in this room. <laughs> all right. So, but uh, communication came along as one of the like the new things that leaders uh, needed to uh, to do. Um, uh, and uh, beside that, of course, uh, what else can the people in this room, the students, what can they basically already now begin to practice and be good at if they want to develop leadership skills? And of course, besides Peter being true them to themselves, but what 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 should they uh, what should they practice? Yeah. I, I don't know what they should practice, but they should practice. That is my key message. I think you should just go out there and, and, and do whatever you can and face people. Face people who would disagree with you and stand up and try to explain why you should do this and that. And that would put you under pressure. And, and then you can be even more ambitious later on, but just go out there and, and practice. That will help you tremendously. Yeah. Face people you disagree with. That's a good advice. Jeff? I think one of the things that always happens to um, <clears throat> to us as people and as leaders is that we tend to grow older. That's probably a given. <laughs> and with that comes the explainer gene. That means you come from a world where everything is exploration into a management world where you have to explain why there are differences between what you promised and what you're delivering. And instead of looking for exploring, you're looking mm -hmm. for explaining. <clears throat> so it's an attitude thing. And I think a key the more you can keep that gene inside you of saying, I'm here to explore from I get born to I die, the more fun life will actually be, even including business reviews, because they will be there. I'm quite certain that they will be there forever because we have to make a shareholder value. But the day where the all, all business managers and leaders sit around and say, okay, I didn't make it, but you know what? There is an opportunity in this, as opposed to the explanation was that the sun went down too early or whatever it was. Don't know what it was. Get that gene in. Half mm -hmm. full, not half empty. Come up with solutions. Positive energy. Yes, Anas, what can you practice at home? I would uh, catch up where Peter Tubor uh, left, um, saying that uh, if I was in the audience here as a, a young student, I would be pretty careful to, to get some experience outside uh, Denmark. I think the world you will be a partner of uh, years ahead, that is a very different one from the one we see today. But what is sure is that it's a much more globalized. Mm. It will need that you have not this uh, local view on things as many Danes have today. It's important to get out and mm. reach out and be part of this new world. And I think we are too old for it, but it's up for you to do that. So in order to become a, a good leader, you need, you need to, to go abroad for, for a yeah. while, etc. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Biwa? I think there's so many opportunities for, for you here today to have smaller or bigger leadership roles. You can do things like this, put on the symposium. I think there are 26 of you who've been working on this for a year now. It's a great example of a leadership task that happens in the context of the university. But there are, there's so many others as well, from just putting on a party for your friends on Friday night, uh, all the way up to doing big, big things like this and leading in the university. So look for those challenges every day, because they're, they're, they're right in front of you. Mm. Great, and then we have uh, questions uh, from the audience in the old-fashioned way, by asking if mm. in a microphone. <coughs> That's fun as well. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, I allow myself to change the direction of the debate just slightly. Um, because last Monday, um, at the warm-up event for the symposium, Professor um, Tom Anderson in the, uh, economics, he said that business leaders of today have great responsibility um, because they have great conditions for changing the economic situations of Denmark. Um, and therefore, he, for example, pointed out that they should educate lesser, employ lesser educated employees. So I would like to hear what your view would be on this and uh, 
how would you do how would you deal with it so to understand it correctly um of course maybe not uh, to uh, to be about the three of you you, uh, you need to hire uh, you need you cannot ask so many demands of the people you hire in order to uh, to help people that are unemployed is is that the question yes and also well, do they the have like the responsibility of helping unemployment in Denmark yes exactly and also maybe perhaps beyond what would affect the uh, effectivity or productivity of the company negatively Yes. Well, Jeff, maybe you should uh, start answering that because uh, your yeah. company pretty much uh, hire <coughs> a lot of people who can't find uh, jobs so many elsewhere. Yeah, I see two points in your in your question. One is, of course, a very delicate one, which is: is my job to improve productivity in Denmark, or is my job to improve productivity in ISS? And obviously, my job is to do it in ISS. And about 4% of these, the workforce in ISS is in Denmark, and the rest is outside. So that's always a dilemma now, because it's a global world. So looking at what can actually help Denmark in specific is a fun project off work. Uh, at work, I have a different responsibility. I haven't said that. The other part of the question is equally important no matter where we are, particularly in my business. Um, there's no doubt that the. In a, in a business like ours and being great leaders and so forth, we can have a business purpose and we can have a mission to accomplish um, in our business. It's about facilitating the purpose of our customers. So when we clean in a hospital, we should be healing patients. That's great. But outside that, you need now as great leaders to create a bigger purpose. And that bigger purpose in ISS is, of course, to fight illiteracy, to make sure that everybody that's on the lowest sort of step on, on the ladder, that they get an opportunity to get one or two or three steps up, whatever they want to achieve on their own accord. So I think companies have a responsibility to be attractive places to work. At the end of the day, it's about shareholder value to actually create this greater purpose. And in our case, it is to fight illiteracy. You've seen it today from Ala, they got another uh, uh, dimension of their greater purpose to life. But that's how we internally work mm. with it. <coughs> so yes, a political question, Peter. I was just wondering, like, do, do we see the military also as a place where we uh, keep uh, unemployment uh, low? No, not not really. But no, but it, there's a there's a point to the question. If I understood it right, you know, sometimes we are asked to take young men in because we are told they could do it with a little bit of good discipline. So we can help them, and we can probably help them to mature. I'm not, I have no doubt. But it's not our core task, and we are not paid for that. So, at the end of the day, we it it is kind of challenging my budget. So if I am to do this on behalf of, of this nation. Just give me the money, I can do this. But if I am to do this with the same structure, which are going to fight, literally fight to survive in Iraq, in Afghanistan, then I'm not sure it's the right balance. And I will question that. Mm. And Anas, you moved uh, also in the, in the public sector for, for many years. What do you think of the discussion? Is the private companies also there to to help unemployment in, uh, in Denmark for the, for the people who have difficulties finding a job? Um, maybe I can answer the question in, in a more broad uh, <coughs> framework uh, instead of specifically looking into, uh, into educating people, take the whole uh, corporate social responsibility, which is a broader uh, issue. And I think taking that uh, angle, then our companies have a, uh, and they take on a big responsibility and it costs some money, but the, the funny thing is that when you look into the companies who have taken the lead on social corporate res responsibility, being uh, to the, towards the workforce or being towards environment <coughs> or whatever, these companies are actually also uh, doing uh, some of the best jobs when it comes to making profits. So there's not, uh, there's not necessarily a, a, a contradiction between being advanced towards social corporate responsibility and making good money. And maybe uh, even in the future, it will be uh, exactly the opposite. The, the companies who are responsible in that way will be honored by the, the, their customers. So I just, uh, is this related to what we're talking about right now? Yeah, a little. All right. Uh, it's a question. Right, we'll go back to. It's a question about the uh, globalization. Um, these days, we're talking a lot about companies going abroad moving outside the country of Denmark. And my question is, 
Do you think that Danish business leaders has a responsibility to the Dan Danish state or is the philosophy just that money makes the world go around? Right, yes, that's a very interesting question. So uh, are, P are companies uh, like your I ISS, are you obligated to stay in Denmark forever just because you were born here? No. No. Um, the company is owned by shareholders. Actually today, I guess the shareholder split in ISS is much more foreign than it is Danish. Uh, not a guess, I know, that's a fact. Mm -hmm. So this is an international company. It is not a Danish company. It's got Danish roots, so that's why we're here. So um, you can call it whether the money makes the world go round. I don't think so. I think it also makes the world go round. But of course, values and concepts and leadership principles and so forth are extremely important. But my responsibility is purely towards the company, making sure it's got longevity, sustainability, and the shareholder value has been created from that. So whether that's placed in Denmark or in Timbuktu, I'm sorry, it's my responsibility. Having said that, we're still here. Our head office is still here. And the reason why it's still here is that such, there's a lot of values that ISS is built on, which is the exact values we're living off. Like you heard with Arla, the values of a Nordic management, a Nordic or origin, with values where we take care of our employees, when you have 55,000 employees in Indonesia, is worth a lot. We've got 55,000 people in India, so that value of being Nordic, maybe even Danish, actually sells a lot of products out around in the world. So, yes, it's probably the latter, but of luckily, Denmark does have a good reputation. So, and uh, Peter, we're gonna skip you on this one, <laughs> because I assume I'm that you happy. don't think the Danish military should be uh, outsourced or placed in France. <laughs> uh, but, uh, Peter, you, uh, you're Norwegian born, you are based in Seattle, and you are, how do you think of this discussion? I mean, how would you, would you see upon that in, in the States? Well, uh, actually, I, uh, I want to refer back to something I said already, is because I think the answer from the panel was clear. The question you could ask is, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Would it be better if more Danish companies were chauvinist or parochial in their parochial in their approach and favored Danes over other people, right? <coughs> and favored Denmark over other countries? Mm. The answer to that is it's a huge advantage for you that that is no longer so. It used to be so. French companies hired French managers and promoted French people. It's not so anymore. And you look at the number of Indians who are now running large Fortune 500 companies based in the US. And um, I'm sure you've seen a, an increase in Danes that run big companies outside Denmark as well. But so are, 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 are national born companies, do they have a special obligation to stay in the country they are born due they to they don't have that obligation. They don't have an obligation to promote their own the citizens. They don't have any, it's, it's just not there. They have an obligation to their shareholders, which is great for you. Because the more meritocratic and the more global these companies are, the more opportunities for you, because you come from a place where you're used to dealing with a lot of different people, unlike a lot of the bigger, company, uh, bigger, bigger countries in the world. And so it's a net gain for you. Yeah. Thank you. So, so Anas, how do you see the discussions? You are, you are on the board of, uh, of many uh, companies also in Denmark. Yes, but I see it. I, I couldn't add much to, the, to my two colleagues here. I, I share the so views. The great, so the question is, uh, no, they don't have a special responsibility to, uh, to stay here as a, as a leader. That's not the responsibility they, um, that's on top of their list. So let's go back to, uh, to the things we're talking about, about leadership. You had some great advices on what to practice at home, and that was face people who disagree the glasses uh, half full, not half empty, be international, several other things. But uh, can you learn to be a good leader or is, it, or is it something that you are born with, basically? What do you think? Jeff? Uh, yes, you can. I don't think you're born to be a leader. I think you can have talent as a leader and particularly you can have talent to be a good communicator as we talked about before. <coughs> but just because you're good at opening your mouth, it not, doesn't necessarily mean that anything good comes out. <laughs> and um, there's a lot of people that believe that that is all there's to leadership. It's not. It's like being a football player or anything else. You can have a huge talent, but re what really matters is hard work. Mm -hmm. So yeah. can you do it with less talent? Of course you can. I mean, I do actually believe that specialists become, can become great leaders. They just need to work on their deficiencies and they have to get the right coaches around. And then it's a different management structure around them. The leadership team around an introvert 
it can actually compensate for that. So I don't think there is one type of person. You can learn it, absolutely. And remember, it is a discipline. So even if you're great at it, keep learning. You can get better. Yes, Peter, what do you think? I, I, I tend to disagree with Jeff because I think you, of course you can learn and of course you can improve. But I think if you take a group like this, this form here, and I think you could separate, like half of you would be brilliant leaders and the other one could probably become good leaders. But I think there is, if you look into it, and, and we use it because we, we, the way we are looking for new officers, we try to figure out who ha got the potential to become great leaders. And we are looking into intelligence, integrity, uh, willpower, and that kind of stuff. And then we build on it. I think it's much better to, to take those who we believe have the potential to become great leaders, and then we teach them to become officers, the military discipline, and not the other way around. But it's, that, that is our, that's my opinion. I think, yes, there are differences by nature. You are born with some certain talent. Great, so we have a no, we have a, a yes. What do you think, Anas? Um, I tend to agree with both of them. <laughs> <laughs> but I think uh, to put another angle to this, that. Um, one of the most important things for a leader is that he has the ability to gather clever people around him. Because you can't do a lot yourself. What you can do is appoint your closest uh, leaders and, if, and you can learn to be good at that. So, so therefore I think you can learn a lot of these skills and <coughs> especially you can learn uh, the very important and crucial skills of uh, of appointing the right and the most bright people uh, just around, around you, so you get the right inputs. So uh, a, a good leader is a good listener. Yeah. And uh, we can all listen, so everybody can become a good leader if they learn to listen. Is that That's too journalistic angle no, or no? Yeah. Yes, Biwa? Yeah, I think first of all, I think the, the military point of view on this uh, is easy to reconcile with the notion that you can be a good leader uh, and you can learn it almost no matter what the starting point is. Because it's very context sensitive. You probably wouldn't choose Gandhi or Mother Teresa in, in your group that you would turn into be officers, but they were fantastic leaders in other contexts. So I think that's the way to think about, there, there are people who would be very good at leadership in one context and people who would in, in other contexts. But, it needs practice and practice and practice, mm -hmm. and it needs something that's actually harder than it sounds. <coughs> and I think it's hard every day, and that's self-awareness. The ability to understand your own strengths, your own weaknesses, mm -hmm. your own effect on people is something you can never practice hard enough because you have to work on it every single day. So it needs to be practiced, it needs to be learned, but it is very context-specific. All right, so uh, whether you were all born for it or not, you are all uh, in top management today. And uh, now the question is, uh, basically, did you choose to become a leader at some point in your younger years, or did it happen accidentally? And also, I'd like to, add, to put it together with another question that's, that I have down here, and that is, at what point in y your career did you realize that, that this was the way it was going and that you had the potential in you? So um, was it something you choose, and where did you realize this is, this is what I'm actually about to do? Who would like to start? Peter? Yeah, I can. I, was, I had two, uh, two ideas. Either I would sit here like you, uh, studying in, in, in university, or then this up came this idea. And I was uh, coaching uh, sports clubs. I was among people. I had difference in my school days, uh, high school. I, I became across, you know, got small leadership uh, roles to play, and I realized this was actually challenging, and I was good at it. You know, people listened, and I was feeling good about it, this interaction. So I thought about it. Well, I need to find a place where I have this leadership, and I, um, I, I would like to have people around me and see if I could, could talk them into and, and create a kind of atmosphere and then make them move in, in a certain direction. I like that. How old were you at that time? I think it was about uh, 17, 18. 18, yeah. And then, that, so that was also, that was where you realized that you were able to do it and that's also where you choose that you were going to go yeah. for the top. I thought yeah. this, uh, you know, in the army, we have people around you. You are given a responsibility as a very young sergeant and just go out there and experience it. And, and even though I noticed that some officers, if they did, 
you know, later on they could go and sw swap to the civilian companies. So it wouldn't be an either or. It, it, I could actually, if I wouldn't like it years to come, I could probably go into the civilian companies, but I've been there ever since. Mm. Anas, uh, you became the permanent secretary of state. When was that clear to you that this was going to happen? When, when did you decide that? Uh yes, I never, ac never decided, actually. It just came around uh, that way. Uh, so I would say... Uh I, I don't know, should we believe that? Because I heard, <laughs> I heard from people working in the, in, the, in the Ministry of Finance, and that's mm. a pretty tough environment. Yeah, yeah, sure. I started, uh, <laughs> I started there many, many years ago, and when I started, I had an ambition to, to lead a small group. That was what, uh, what I was uh, looking for. I didn't have a plan that I should, and I never actually uh, believed that I should end up uh, as permanent secretary, which is uh, the top job. Um, but I went for the, for the small leadership and the small group, and I liked that. And then I would say it was uh, far, uh, to a large extent, it was uh, coincidence and things developed that, that way. It was not due to any plan at all. Mm. But of course, the day I put in my application for the, the job as permanent secretary, that day I, I had the, the dream. <laughs> you realized But it, not yeah. much before. <laughs> All right. Uh, Pivo, what about you? What's your story? Yeah, I, I don't think I thought of myself as a leader until probably five or six leadership jobs into my career. If I start from the first band that I formed and the rock club that I started yeah. and the student association I chaired, I, I, this so was stuff I did because I loved it. Yeah, but th so you were a young leader, but you were in the school. Yeah, but I didn't think of myself in that way. Bands. I thought of myself as somebody who loved playing music, loved listening to music, loved travel and therefore and I did these things. And how old were you when you formed your uh, rock band? Uh, 12, 12, 13. Right, yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when did you realize, hey, I, maybe I'm a leader. Maybe, th maybe I'm, this is what uh, I'm going to do. 15 yeah. years later, maybe. 15 years later, know. okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a bit slow. What, what yeah, I'm a bit slow yeah. in that yeah. sense. <laughs> Bad <laughs> self-awareness. I'm trying to get better at that. <laughs> and Jeff, so. It, it, it's a hard one to, to answer, but uh, I don't think I ever realized it, to be honest. It's a bit strange when you have 521,000 people working it today? for you. Do you realize it today? Do you know it today? I understand that, but, but uh, it's some things that happens. I mean, if, if, if you're, if you, I love working, I love taking responsibility, and I just love to get in the middle of things, or most things. Some things I'll just keep out of, and obviously I won't get leaders uh, in that. So it's, it's, it's about staying true to yourself and just continue to do what you enjoy. And then what comes along and I've actually changed careers. I mean, I've jumped from one position to up or down the ladder. I don't really care what people think. I, th I, I do look inside, I look at myself, and I think, can I do this? Yes, I can. Is it a leadership job? I never asked that question. Never, ever. I never, want, I never aspired for it. I aspire for having fun. And I aspire to stand here and hopefully have some sort of impact on you going forward in the future. That's what I like. And, and uh, that is probably leadership, but I never took a decision. And um, also, um, one more great question from, uh, from the audience. Um, when you're a good leader, can you change branches and then automatically become a good leader in another company? Or are you kind of growing into the DNA of a certain organization or company that you are with? So, um, or is it uh, something you can take with you? Is this a formula? Yeah, Anas? Um, I, uh, I would say yes, you mm. can change. Uh, and I'll do it because I did change myself. So uh, um, I had this long experience in the Ministry of Finance. I think it uh, worked out very well. I'll talk about that uh, in a moment uh, in another audience. And then I decided after 25 years actually in the Ministry of Finance that now I wanted to become a businessman. And uh, so I did that, and uh, I think I had some success with that. And, and you think, uh, uh, I don't, let's see if you will answer it honestly, but when you came to Dung uh, from the Danish Ministry of Finance, uh, did you feel that the leadership uh, you, you practiced in the ministry, that you could just, you know, copycat it over on, on Dung? Some of it. Some of it was new, of course. Uh, 
this about the numbers on the bottom line that that was a different game uh, for, for instance communicating i, I get but that's the, a big the difference communication and getting people to follow you and making a strategy for that was the same uh, tools that i used in the ministry all right uh peter yeah, I, you, I think could, could I you th go I into a private company i know that uh, that uh, that you've been tested for this and you could basically the test says you could go into a private company yeah, i think i would agree with uh, anna that you could you could do this and i think and you have so many great examples that people really swap um, the disciplines. And, and the strategic leadership, yeah, is definitely the same. But I guess if you're moving into an, an company, an area where you're less familiar, you, will, you would, and, and great leader will do that, will be a little bit more humble. And they will make sure that the people that get around them, like Anna said, will kind of cover for that. And they will make their own introduction program. They, they will be smart enough to adapt, and, and shortly they will be um, they will be flying, and uh, so basically, yes, you you could do it. I I can have a little uh, a little story from the real life. Uh, this spring, I was with uh, Jørn V. Knudstorp, also an earlier attendant uh, here at uh, Aarhus Symposium. I was with Jørn V. Knudstorp in China, uh, of course, the, the CEO of Lego, <coughs> and 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 we talked about this, you know, him changing jobs because. Um, it would be rather easy for him to, to get another job somewhere in, uh, out in the big world. And he basically said that uh, he didn't want to do that. And he also said, you know what, Nina, I think maybe I would be a clown in another company. <laughs> and uh, I think that was very honest of him to, to say. And um, uh, because he, he, he's so much passionate and he's so personalized into the Lego brand. Uh, what, what do you think of that? It felt very, really true when he said it. I was like, oh, yes, sure. Yeah, you would be a clown in another company. But <laughs> What do you think, Jeff? What about you? Could you uh, go out in a totally another branch uh, and run it as successfully as ISS? Only if only if I have the passion, and I think that's what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. If you if you create, uh, I need the passion. I need to like what I do. I need to have respect for it. I mean, getting up every morning again and helping people uh, getting a job and being able to actually get bread on the table is not that big purpose in Denmark, but it is in a big part of my organization. I am extremely proud of that. And that purpose, of course, drives all the energy. And I can do that in other companies, obviously. Can do. I could do that, but I had to have the passion. Otherwise, mm -hmm. I wouldn't feel for it. I think the one thing, though, that we have to remember, and that is about the clown part. Just because you're the good leader or communication uh, sort of character, you've got to remember that the devil is in the details. So you, have to, you can't just be the clown running up here again with the cheering. You've got to know something about the business. Mm -hmm. So if you're willing to put that effort into mm -hmm. it, then you can change, but yeah. you got to do that. Yeah, mm. agreed. Biwa, what's your take on it? <coughs> Would you fit into agreed. a more old-fashioned company? Uh, I've worked in many different businesses. I was in the oil business, I've been a consultant, uh, media, software, internet. Um, I don't think I was equally good in all of them. Um, so my take on this would be that uh, there are some people who are exceptional leaders in certain contexts that can be pretty good leaders in other contexts. And there are some exceptions that can be good leaders almost everywhere. But the norm is probably that there's, there is a context that's best for you. Um, so of course, if you're lucky, you find that context early and you go for it. All right, so we need to uh, round it up now, unfortunately. We could keep doing this all afternoon, I think. Uh, and I was just looking at the, the next questions that were about to come, and I think that the answer basically to that was, you know, you just have to marry somebody who's also a CIO, <laughs> because then uh, there will be like this common understanding <laughs> of, the, of the thing, right, Anas? But uh, the question is how you manage the personal and, the, and, and business life all together. But um, <coughs> final questions. Uh, you have all been asked to, uh, to come with one advice that uh, everybody in here can take with them home. You've already come with some good ones on what to practice at home. But if you had to come with one advice uh, from your experience, from your time as a, as, as a, as, as leader, uh, for leaders of tomorrow, what uh, what would it be? And Biwa, should we start with you? Yeah. One advice. One piece of advice. I think it's been said already, but practice every day because there are opportunities in front of you every single day. So practice what? Leadership. Leadership. There are and leadership opportunities literally, literally around you every day. I was, I was sitting so by... So basically, what do you do? You try to, to see if you can get a group with yeah. you down to lunch no, or something? Like actually, yeah. I was just <laughs> reflecting on this because I was <coughs> sitting down um, with my neighbor. He's an ex-Microsoft executive and his 13-year-old daughter decides that she literally wanted, she wanted to get... I can't remember what it was she wanted to get done. She wanted to get out on the lake with a boat. 
and she says, okay guys, let's motivate here and that, get this mess cleaned up so we can go out in the lake on a boat. And that's a 13 year old that's exercising leadership in her family. So that's the very micro level. And then you have these that we discussed already, and then you go all the way up to what you see on the stage. But they're, they're there every day. I, I can see that very, very, very easily getting completely annoying for everybody around you. But uh, yeah. Well, she, did, <laughs> she doesn't do it all the time. She did it then, and she got out where she wanted to go, uh, on the lake, on the boat. If she just said, Dad, I don't want to go on the lake, it wouldn't happen. <laughs> see, it wouldn't have happened. Yeah. Anas, one piece of advice? Yes, I uh, to frame it shortly, I would say be dedicated to what you do uh, and be sure that it's, uh, it's in parallel with your, with your own uh, values. I have asked myself uh, a number of times if I ever was uh, asked uh, to be the CEO of a tobacco company, would I, I, I haven't been asked so it hasn't been that difficult, but would I accept such an offer? Imagine the wages were high and everything was nice. Would I imagine such a job? I hope I would say no, because it's not, I don't think it's so good to, to, to work for things that, that is against uh, people's health and, and things like that. So be dedicated to what you do and make sure it's in accordance with your own values. Right. Your, might, your wife might get the CEO job then. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about it. <laughs> All right, Peter? Well, <coughs> I, I would agree to uh, what Biwa said about the practice. So, so, so my next one will be to create your own leadership profile. Look inside yourself and find out where are your strong positions, what are your personal values, what, what means something to you, because you will need to bring that forward once you have your leadership uh, engagement and responsibility. You need to be honest. You need to tell the story of the narrative of the company, whatever. You need to be honest. You need to be truthful for yourself, find your own leadership profile. And Jeff? Yeah, be, a, be authentic, but that also <coughs> means if you're not a leader, don't become one. There's so, so much pressure around from everybody in a particular society like ours that career and career moves are the only thing that happens, and career moves are only to become the CEO title and the big car and the, and the money or whatever it is. I've seen so many miserable people being CEOs around the world. Don't become one. Because have your own life, have fun, and make sure if you do that, you will also succeed in having a, well, a great life, basically. That's most important. So uh, just to, uh, to round it up, so uh, practice every day, be dedicated, create your own profile, and be authentic. But can we all agree that you think it's fun? Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. yes. So, <laughs> but that's uh, it for in here right now. Thank you very much, all four of you.